Hi, I thought I'd answer an interesting comment somebody left on my uh, recent second channel video here. Thank you very much, Cow Holly. Dave, can you make a quick video to tell a story about your profile image? The famous hand one. Um, well, sorry, I was using my left hand. Why do you have your hand reaching for the camera? What were you doing in that image? You chose it for your branding for a reason. I'm sure there is a story there and I'm missing out. Um, Yes, I've, I've only ever told this story once, I believe, and that was at a presentation I gave at the University of New South Wales uh, last year now. Um, it, you kind of had to be there. There is footage of it, but uh, I've, I've released several clips from that, but only several clips. I don't think anyone will ever see the full presentation. You just had to be there. So thank you very much. That is an interesting question. So let's go through it, shall we? The history of my hand profile um sorry it might be flipped here because i flipped my camera to make my eyes look on the uh screen um this was we can here is the original image and it's called uh dave lab arms with two s's uh four dot jpeg and we can go in here and let's get the um the canon <laughs> the official canon of this uh, photo. Let's go into the EXIF information here, and we can see it was shot, for those playing along at home, with a Sony DSC S90 camera. I think it was a little silver pocket camera from memory. It wasn't mine, it was somebody else's in the uh, lab. 27th of October 2006, this photo was taken. And I was working at, um, as, as you can see, um, I was working at, uh, well, this wasn't my bench, it was sort of like a community uh, bench in one of the main uh, labs that we had here, but this was the project that I was uh, working on at the uh, time, and uh, it's in the name there, the a uh, the ARMS, as we called it, with double S, uh, which from memory stands for Autonomous Remote monitoring seismic solution. <laughs> so it's basically an ocean bottom uh, recorder here, um, which we got um, from a company in uh, Germany. And uh, this was a, this is a basically a data logger. Basically, it's a multi-channel uh, data logger. It used a TMS320 processor. I think I've mentioned this before in several uh, videos. TMS320 processor, but it ran the it, it was running on fourth. It was programmed in fourth, <laughs> believe it or not. And um, so this little um, sort of, you know, small company in Germany actually made this uh, little niche data recorder. It was for the seismic market, I think. Um, we just happened to uh, use this and um, this uh, this front board here is an interface board that I developed to actually interface to this uh, cube based. So it's actually got boards on the front sides. I think there was only the top bit that didn't have a board. So it was all big. The processor was on this board at the back. I think this was the acquisition board or something like that. Um, and power supply board at the back or something like that. So it was designed to be battery powered for an underwater uh, system, sorry, I'm tangenting off into what this thing is here. I'll get to the story about the photo later. You gotta stick around and need to get that YouTube engagement up, right? Um, not that I do this deliberately, I just go off on a tangents. Uh, yeah, so I designed this interface uh, board at the time, and here I am trying to debug it. Um, and this was the, I believe I've done, this was where I was spending weeks debugging this thing, and I think I've done this, um, it's the ESD chair video, you know, when I get up from the chair, it generates an ESD spike, and that was um, causing problems in this thing, and it took weeks to solve, and I finally figured that out, it was me getting up off the chair, which was causing an ESD impulse, which was uh, causing havoc in the system, and it was, yeah, it was a very interesting fault, okay, but uh, yeah, I was working at a company called uh, Surcell at the time, you might be able to just see that over there, there's my, you know, we had the company notebook at the time, <laughs> the name is Surcell, there it is, you can barely get that, uh, commercial in confidence, you're not allowed to uh, read that. And uh, yeah, so yeah, because every time everything you had to do, it had to go in the logbook and everything. And there I am um, using an Agilent uh, scope there in the in the background there for you Rigol fanboys. That's the Rigol 5000, I believe. This predates the DS1052E, the small slim form factor. 
Uh, so the 1052E was uh, basically a follow-up to this, but in that slim form factor and at a cheaper uh, price point. But yeah, that's the original Rigol DS5000 uh, there. So uh, yeah, that's about all there is. And a CRT monitor, <laughs> a CRT off a newfangled flat screen in 2006. So yeah, with this uh, data recorder, at the time I was actually uh, sent over to Germany because uh, we bought the rights to this data recorder. So I was sent over um, to ensure the technology Technology transfer from this uh, small German company over to us. So in the end, we had the rights to actually produce this ourselves, but we had to maintain it. So I had to start learning fourth at the uh, time. So <laughs> to try and actually, uh, yeah, uh, troubleshoot and do upgrades to this thing with this. F and and the fourth was the fourth compiler was in German as well. Sorry, I do not remember the name of it, but if anyone knows, leave it in the comments down below. Some obscure. I think it was written by some university professor. In Germany or something like that. Yeah, fourth fourth compiler on a TMS three twenty processor. Um, yeah, it was it, it was a mess, but it worked. So this was um, uh, right hand. Where did this come about? Now there are other photos. There are more. There are five photos in this uh, series of photos that were uh, that I took here, right? So here's the first one, and obviously I'm turning my head, something like that. Um, here's the second one, me not really smiling, kind of, you know, just looking a bit mm, boring, right? So there we go, that's a better one. <laughs> so I took this uh, third one, and then uh, there's this fourth one, which is the famous hen one like this, and there is a fifth one, which is just me trying to look down onto the bench, and it's a bit blurry as well, because I probably moved my head. So, um... <laughs> Why do these photos exist? Well, uh, from memory, uh, well, I, I took them. I had the camera set up with a self-timer on top of something there. Uh, I think it was a computer or something. And at the time, and I mentioned this in my presentation back then, we didn't really take, you know, digital camera. Nobody had a phone, a shoe phone with a camera in it. That wasn't a thing, right? So, uh, you know, a few people had little digital cameras. I got my first digital camera in 2000, I think. 2000. Um, so yeah, I had a digital camera at the time, but we didn't, we didn't have the culture of like taking photos of everything like we do these days with our stupid shoe phones, right? Million photos exist. Everything's documented. Um, back then it was quite rare uh, to take photos. And I've done that photo of um, that uh, teardown video of the uh, Sony DSC I can't remember camera that used the three and a half, three and a half inch uh, floppies in there. And um, yeah, you know, it was just rare to take photos back then. And I was thinking at the time uh, that I don't really have any photos of me at work. And like, it, it just didn't, I don't know why it occurred to me one day, I don't have any photos of me at work. And I think somebody came in and uh, took a snap of me um, at the bench and I, and that maybe that's what uh, actually triggered my thought. Oh, wow, <laughs> I better get a copy of that. Sorry, I don't have a copy of that random photo that somebody took that I think, and maybe they left the camera or I got the camera later. And that's probably when I got the idea, I should actually take some photos of me at work, at a bench, doing something. So I just happened to be working at this uh, bench. So I set the camera up, set uh, self-timer mode, and, um, you know, boom, that one sucked. I, you know, walked around and checked it. That one was like, uh, didn't lie, I wasn't smiling, that was boring. That was better. But, and I, honestly, I do not remember why I'm reaching there. I just thought, I don't know, I'd do some stupid candid shot as well. I don't know. So, I, so my hand's out like that, and... That's the story behind that. And then I took another one, um, like more serious, but that one didn't turn out. And as he said here, uh, you chose it for your branding for a reason. Well, no, I didn't. Because back when I started, remember, I'm one of the first full-time YouTubers in Australia. I'm not the first, I don't think, but I'm one of the first, like really early. And back then, nobody did it. Well, especially when, like I started in 2009. So back then, nobody started a YouTube channel thinking that it would be a full-time career, right? Nobody was a full-time career in 2009 doing YouTube that I'm aware of. I don't know, leave it in the comments, but you know, it, it just wasn't a thing. You started it because you just enjoy what you're doing. So there was no branding. Totally different these days. If you're starting up a YouTube channel, highly advise you to actually consider branding and a, a particular style of video and everything and stick to it. Whereas mine was just 
you know, and just putting up videos for fun, as all YouTubers did back in the day. So there was no branding. So I didn't pick this for branding or anything else. Uh, when I started my channel, um, you needed like a thumbnail or something, you know, or, okay, well, not many photos of me actually exist. <laughs> um, you know, uh, as a family, we weren't really into taking photos. And uh, as I said, there were practically none of me at any of the jobs I've ever worked at. So I went through, well, do I have a, what, what's the best photo of me and preferably one doing some sort of technical thing, right? Or working at the bench. This was probably the only photo of me working at a bench at the time. Um, so I actually remember this video. So I, I remember these photos. So I looked through all five and that was the most exciting one. <laughs> Right, so I so I picked it. I thought, ah, oh, that looks stupid. It wasn't because like this predates the open mouth smiley, you know, the open mouth clickbait smiley that everyone does these days, right? Or used to do. Is it a thing anymore? I don't know. But yeah, yeah, oh uh, yeah, Mr. Beast does it, doesn't he? The open mouth thing. Did I pioneer that? I don't know. But it wasn't a thing back then. I just chose it because it looked a tad more exciting than uh, you know that. <laughs> So yeah, that is the reason. That is the reason behind that. Um, and if you're wondering about the um, ocean bottom module, I did find one photo. Here it is here at a trade show. Even though I was working for Surcell, this is actually a uh, Tally's uh, branded thing because we changed names just during that period or something like that. So here is the uh, the data recorder sits inside here, and this is an ocean bottom seismic uh, thing for oil exploration um, and it's got uh, accelerometers in here like three axis accelerometer uh, boards in here so I designed all the boards for all of this so uh, yeah so this sits on the ocean bottom it sits on the sea floor and you put multiple you deploy remote operating vehicles that actually swim down to the bottom of the ocean and they actually deploy these in the, in an array like this and they're autonomous recorders and they're all time synced back on the boat and uh, that's why I've done a lot of uh, shock and vibrational analysis of stuff of digitally temperature control crystal oscillators because these things had to be like super synchronized and you know everything yet autonomous at the same time because they don't communicate with each other. So uh, yeah, so these are ocean bottom seismic exploration. So what they do is uh, they set off gigantic air rams on the uh, surface of the water. They penetrate the ocean uh, floor and they reflect off the oil, you know, fields underneath the, you know, the various bedrock and they reflect back and uh, they are picked up by the um, sensor on here. Um, and then they can use, they literally use supercomputers to um, analyze all, all the data and they can hopefully find oil. That's the, <laughs> that's the uh, thing about this. But yeah, these were ocean bottom. I think we, uh, that was capable of 300 meters depth. I think if memory serves correctly, but yeah, this was all, uh, you know, this was all sealed There's giant, you know, huge O-rings in there and everything else. And yeah, they, um, and big handles on there. So the ROV uh, things can actually grab little claw things can actually grab this thing and move it and lay it down um, on the ocean floor. So there you go. Um, I do actually, my name is on a patent for this uh, somewhere. Um, I, I got paid $1, <laughs> $1 for my, <laughs> my uh, co-patent uh, along with several other uh, people on there. So yeah, um, that's the arms thing. And also I found one other photo. You might recognize somebody here, Dougie. <laughs> This is my mate Doug Ford, um, and we were working on th this. is a new design uh, thing that we were working on uh, here before it got uh, canned um, and the group was uh, broken up. But yeah, we had some production over there, I think, or a small scale run or something. And uh, yeah, I was working at Tally's at the time, so there you, there you go. So that was that probably so that predates uh, that, that would predate that, yeah. Oh, 2002. Oh, geez. Okay, yeah, so that's a while back. So there you go. That's just Dougie and I uh, there working at uh, Tally's back at the uh, time. But yeah, this was a uh, Surcell uh, during the Surcell days. So there you go. Thank you very much, uh, Cal Holly, for that excellent question. That is the history behind the hand photo. It's not done for branding. It just, uh, as the name EEV blog was not done for branding purposes at the uh, time. It was just the electronics engineering video blog. And then at the time I talked on the Oz Electronics group, uh, I think. And I said, well, does anyone have a better name? And everyone went, nah. 
So we shortened it to EEV blog and that's it. It wasn't done for branding reasons. It was just done because, you know, EEV blog was just a short version of the electronics engineering video blog. And as it turned out, it's, you know, decent branding because I can have EEV discover. I can have EEV whatever. So yeah, it turned out to be decent branding in the end. And the hand thing was just a random thing at the time because I thought I needed at least a couple of photos of me at work. It might come in handy one day. As it turns out, it did. Anyway, thanks for that question. <laughs> Thoughts and comments down below. Catch you next time.